Greetings and welcome. My name is Frank Murdoch. I'm with the uh, Lean Enterprise Division and I'm hosting today's uh, division webinar. We hold these webinars once each month and they are free to all our members. Our webinars are recorded. So previous webinars are available on the ASQ Lean Enterprise Division YouTube channel on August 8 at 1.30 uh, p.m. Eastern, 10.30 a.m. Pacific time, Lance Coleman will be presenting Maybe at Risk But Not in Peril as a webinar on how lean implementation can help manage risk. Today, our webinar presenter is Nick Vias from the Marshall School of Business at the University of Southern California. Nick's topic is Lean Six Sigma for Global Supply Chain Leadership. Nick will also be leading a workshop entitled Leaning Your Supply Chain at our upcoming Lean Practitioner Summit, November 1st and 2nd in Pomona, California. But first, uh, before Nick gets started, some logistics. Everybody will be on mute, but you are free to post questions to Nick as you think of them. Nick has reserved about 10 minutes at the end of his presentation to answer your questions which we will take one at a time. Now here is Nick Vias. Frank, thank you very much and good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, before I get into the presentation, let me uh, briefly give short background. So from academic standpoint, uh, my background is uh, my undergraduate was in industrial systems engineering uh, with math. Uh, and my postgraduate uh, focus was on finance and operations. And my current doctoral uh, program that I'm enrolled in focuses on blended quality management in higher education institutes. Uh, professionally, the journey that I was on, which was started out in consulting, uh, and then from consulting, I took a detour into operations, starting out with the uh, Federated Stores, which is used to be Macy's East. And when they started to move towards the West Coast uh, through the mergers and acquisitions, uh, I was part of the team uh, transitioning from there to Duty Free, then to Sears, followed by the Toys R Us. In each of these roles, uh, I was in charge of the global supply chain management. So from sourcing, in many cases, all the way through the last mile delivery, including the reverse logistics. Uh, and over the last six years, I'm the founding executive director for the Center for Global Supply Chain Management, uh, as well as the academic director for Masters of Science in Global Supply Chain Management here at the University of Southern California. The subject that I teach, obviously, is uh, quality management, uh, focus on Lean, Six Sigma, but also uh, uh, classes within the supply chain. So today what I thought the objective would be, really, is to sort of starting off with the goal statement. And since my days, uh, when I was fortunate enough to implement Lean, in supply chain 30 years ago to the lean journey today, I've come to the conclusion that we should not focus our lean efforts on fixing or tweaking what appears to be broken, but rather breaking things by design to change or challenge the current ecosystems. So this is a pretty profound statement, uh, what I'm proposing here. And, and and a sin to that is that what we are seeing in supply chain is a massive disruption. And the, the reason I, I, I say this is that those companies, that they, are, they were the leader 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, they were either disappeared or they're in the process of being disappeared are being disrupted. And those companies that happen to be doing okay today may not actually be doing okay five to 10 years from now. So I think there is a tremendous influx of this. So I wanted to sort of set the stage 
about our opportunities. And I think part of it, what we see is the customers are not looking at the lean out operation. They're just not saying, hey, just give me what you used to give me, but a little bit more efficient. They're looking for some major transformation. They really want to use technology and tool in, integrated into their experience. So the approach, just not from the customer centricity, but we need to start to look at it from the investors and customer, but as well as market forces. What are the markets, market forces? Who are the dis disruptors? And how do you really anticipate those disruptor to help you stay out of the curve? So keeping that theme in mind, some of the futuristic KPIs that should drive the project opportunity is from the traditional measures that would have looked at the return on investments to return on inno innovations. So rather than just looking at the dollar as a sell, we should uh, also focus on how do we actually measure the innovation and impact that will create. And this may not necessarily be as an ROI, the traditional sense we used to measure. This may be an investment we might be making for the future ROI, right? So implementation time versus adoption time, meaning this is no longer just the project manager going to the milestones and accomplishing things, but also the adoption time, how quickly we can actually integrate that innovation into our operational practices, right? So, Uh, if we look at it from the cost standpoint, we need to look at it not only the initial cost, but also the ongoing cost. Futuristic KPIs as to which are the silos that we have in organizations we need to break down and how do we do? So it's not only just uh, from the lean standpoint that we look at the swim lane flow chart or a detailed process flow chart, but looking at actually the silos that exist and how those silos are creating friction and need to be able to measure that. Access to data and then the BI, business intelligence. So these are the futuristic KPIs that then need to be integrated into our lean framework. And I'm not proposing at this point that we get rid of all the traditional KPIs, but I'm saying we should introduce the futuristic KPIs into our technology. One of the other change that I think initially that we should start to embrace as part of our lean practice is a technology, right? Augmented realities, blockchain, predictive and prescriptive analytics, IOTs, conversation based on user interfaces, the tracking, AI and ML, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, how these platforms can be integrated in our future state process map to start to deliver an optimal solution. So what we are seeing from the market research, and my, my focus has been obviously uh, seeing the blended quality management principle, Lean and Six Sigma, uh, as to what company needs um, and talking to the executives, not just here in the US, but the globally, is that in global supply chain field, which obviously spans from the resource acquisitions, manufacturing, consolidation, deconsolidation, transportation, distribution, replenishment, uh, SNOP, sales and operations planning, including finance and the logistics. What we're seeing that the, there's a Anonymous consensus that our industry is going through rapid transformation and evolution. And market forces are unforgiving for the complacency. There's a report that says 40% of the companies that exist in S&P 500 will disappear by 2030. That is a huge statement that executive team is not comfortable with it. Because if the four out of 10 company could have a significant impact because of this transformation, 
and evolution. How do I not only improve what I'm doing, but also continue to do better and stay out of the curve? Other things we see is the trend setters are rewarding the greater proportion than the trend chaser, meaning the people that are driving the disruptions are given disproportionate amount of rewards than those that are trying to just either dodge or maintain the status quo. So conversations with this uh, market research with executives, I think their feeling is that the Lin Six Sigma concept and practice needs to look at the future state solutions with heavy reliance on innovation. So what I'm summarizing, our very traditional demonic approach, which we would consider as define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. So I think defining is still valuable. I think we have done an amazing job from our days in manufacturing to now going through iterations through multiple industries, right? Measuring is still very valuable because it's a data, it allows us to do the baseline assessments. It gives us an ability to collect data. Analyze is still very important because it provides us the root causes. But merely by going through the first D, M, and A, it's not, I'm not trying to just improve, but I want, I want to innovate. And that innovate could be a breakthrough innovations. And then instead of control, I need to start to conceptualize the next big thing while I'm trying to put cement the gains. So what this is actually creating is that yes, we want you to continue to streamline, continue to improve. However, because you have accomplished the improvement from the previous state into the current future state, which is now the current state, let's conceptualize. What is the phase two, phase three? And how do we actually continue to work beyond that? So in supply chain, and my focus is really to give you guys an understanding of how I see this in the supply chain is like in you know, a three different levels that I've seen, right? So entry level supply chain logistics and distributions for the front line, right? Uh, one of the uh, big concern of this evolution that we're going through in technology infusion into the supply chain is the human capital. At each level, from the frontline level, which is level one to level two to level three, as we cover, we don't have enough skill human capital. So as a Lean practitioner, Lean Six practitioners, in our field, we really need to understand how do we bring this group in disseminating the information, both in the subject areas of their frontline day-to-day -day engagement, but also in the lean. So, so level one is designed for the entry level supply chain logistics and distribution frontline, right? So we're talking about the logistics, the basic skills, vocabulary, transportation, material planning, how, when, uh, why, production planning, uh, progressive maintenance. So a lot of the principles that we have learned over the years in manufacturing can really become very useful especially as we start to introduce automations and robotics our distribution centers will look like more like an automated manufacturing plant and we really need to understand that and take the best practices of the pm and inventory management as we were very successfully able to deploy in manufacturing Level two, what I consider is an intermediate level supply chain logistics and distribution. This is designed for the middle management. So we have supply chain management uh, team basically uh, up to about the director level. Uh, inventory planning, me me uh, performance measurement, lean management, lean distribution centers, practi practical decision makers, leadership along the supply chain. I think this group needs to be looked at it in a somewhat the level two and level three, which is an advanced level of supply chain logistics and leadership. This is truly those that are in charge of driving operational excellence, right? 
they have to have an advanced concept of both the micro and macro trend, understand how the demand-driven supply chain management is working, how the global SNOP practices are changing, how do we work with the global vendor and risk management and transforming the operations, and what are the strategy for growth, and how operational excellence practices lean can actually be integrated at the top and then let it percolate throughout the level two and then level one and then create the loop back so it's a closed loop in a circle from one level one to level two to level three and then it just continues on so of course we are talking about the lean right so i wanted to briefly touch uh on the principles that by us saying the lean in supply chain and then the new way of looking at the lean, that doesn't mean that we are getting rid of all the knowledge and the wisdoms we have learned over the last several decades. Right, so we know the history right, from 1900, from the mass production and its way into the Toyota's in 1950s to the jet quarry circles in 80s became very popular, lean manufacturing to lean enterprises, uh, GE sort of uh, defining that new concept of saying, hey, we can actually run a corporation in a very symmetric way, very integrated way with the concept. But that's something post Jack Walsh, what we have seen the lean truly started to percolate into the services and biggest penetrations we were able to make using lean concept was in healthcare. Lean supply chain, in my view, has stayed relatively isolated to distribution. So you see a lot of lean deployment in the warehouses, distribution. There are a lot of Kaizen initiatives, a lot of small projects being driven. But I think time has now come that we need to define and conceptualize lean supply chain as its own body of knowledge, that it can be deployed in an end-to-end -end supply chain ecosystem. And it needs to be thought as from design, through manufacturing all the way to the customer interface. It doesn't matter which channel you're distributing, right? Brick and mortar, B2B, B2C, D2C, does not matter. But if we can start to look at the lean supply chain in that fashion, and then focus of how we can actually identify the physical flow and look at lean within that, Look at the data flow, look at the link within that, and then look at the human capital flow. And then we start to look at them in a very integral way, is what I see the history and evolution of lean leading up to today. And the question is, but well, why? Right? Why do we have a demand for lean in industries, which is we talk about healthcare, service, supply chain, government, for manufacturing? Because we still hear the conversation that lean equals manufacturing, right? It does not work in this field. And my doctoral focus in higher education, so I've been told that we're the education institute. Lean has no place, right? And I actually beg the difference. I think lean has a place. Not only lean has a place, I think lean has a tremendous value proposition. So those industry that they're now feeling the pressure has to see how the previous industrial verticals that they were under the same circumstances, same fractional internal pressure, were able to successfully navigate through that tor you know, torturous journey in a turbulent time using lean as a base. But key keys, customers are demanding many product services, lower volume and quantity. 
You think about Amazon, 24 hours is no longer a big deal. We're talking about same day to four hours to two hours delivery. It's a fierce competition. You simply cannot actually say because you've been in the business or you have a certain size of the market share or you have a dominating footprint in one or other market cap that you're guaranteed the same success for the future. Those days have changed. There will be continued pressure on the price, operating budget, cost of capital, but the most importantly, rapid technological changes. There are some things on the horizon, uh, what well, we are calling this as a so the emerging technology and its impact on supply chain, there are some incredible things that are happening that will change the way we source, procure, consume the future lifestyles. It's incredible. It's very integrated, very global. I'm very excited about it because there's a tremendous opportunity for civilization to adapt and embrace this future. But we'll continue to need more employee involvement. Because we're talking about all this future technology, it does not mean that humans will not play roles. In fact, they will play a very critical role. And I think we have a very critical opportunity to sort of create that. So I just want to kind of understand the definition of lean that what I would consider is really uh, a very systemic approach to identifying and eliminating waste. You know, we are good at defining the non-valued activities through continuous improvement by flowing the product at the pull of the customer in pursuit of perfection. But remember, the customer is changing, the needs are changing, and it's constantly evolving. And we're no longer saying that these customers are giving us feedback once every six months, once every year. It's changing on a daily basis, it's evolving faster. So how do you have to, you have to measure your voice of the customer and understand what is your customer base telling you? And don't wait for them complaining about it. Don't wait for them praising about it. Because guess what? They're already there. They're in the social media talking about services offered by you and how they feel, right? So this, ecosystem of social media has really created a very dynamic voice of the customer that unless you measure and manage, you may be actually going after the initiative to improve in the wrong way. So basically, I think what I simply say is give the customer what they want, when they want, and don't waste anything in a very rapidly evolving industries, period. Because remember, the market forces are changing the consumer behavior. They're not, they didn't, they were waited to say, let me actually do a market consensus for the customers and understand, that, do you really need something faster than 24 hours? Rather, they just say, we can actually deliver something in four hours. And consumer actually changed their behavior and say, you know what, I like that. And I'm willing to pay for it. And there comes a new set of behavior demanding new set of operational processes, new set of uh, human talent supporting those initiatives. So let's look at the value at versus waste because we say we are champion of removing the waste. So let's look at it in global supply chain, right? So we know what value add is, right? The so waste is any activity that's not add value to the final product of the customer, right? So let's look at the value add first. Uh, it's an activity that transform or shape raw material or information to meet final customer requirement, delivering right product at the right price, right place, and the speed. For supply chain, these are important elements, the price, the place, and the speed. Because the broken promises can be communicated to a larger community at a very good speed, right? So you have to ask yourself a question. Is your end-to-end -end process enabling value chain for your customer? 
cheaper, better, faster, first time and every time thereafter. Meaning you simply cannot say, because I'm delivering now in 24 hours, I'm happy and I can wait for another two, three years before I change, or I'm just gonna tweak it. You know, how you continue to actually improve and create your value add to be much more robust of customer adaptation. Integration of emerging technologies to open a potentiality of customer delight. And what customer delight is that you're delivering something the customer is not even telling you through the voice of the customer. You are sort of creating the delight in delivering the value proposition and somewhat when I mean, customers not even expecting. So then if you look at the non-value add, it's if any steps from design to delivery introduces friction from delighting the end customer. Simply put, it's a waste. So if you are in a business, either end-to-end -end or portion of from design to delivery, think of it as what is the friction in the physical flow, in information flow, and in a people flow? Is that restricting you from delighting your customer? Not meeting the customer needs because there are two things two different things we talk about delighting the end customer because the futuristic organizations futuristic kpis are not about meeting the needs because anybody will do that meeting the need is you just trying to stroke away in a stormy water and trading it just enough to survive knowing the fact that you will be ultimately swallowed at some point and drowned. Delighting means that you are actually charting the course and sailing it in the direction that you plan to go. So organization silos causing issues with data flow, decision paralysis, egocentric policies, redundant decision loops, etc. One of the market research was very clear. Those organizations, what I call the robust organizations, they had one thing very clearly defined, that there were no organizations, nobody was wearing the badge when they were driving the operational excellence practices. They were not about maintaining status quo, doing the same thing over while market forces are disrupting the industry. So what I would like to call this as a standpoint of being on a burning platform. Right, so imagine we're in a beautiful building the basement is on the fire and we're sitting in a conference room talking about how to decorate different offices, how do we make people happy, knowing the fact that we're on the burning platform. Anything of that level of urgency or lack thereof, I would consider would be the NVA. Essentials, right? Uh, a lot of time in lean uh, process we justify a lot of waste and past practices or the paradigms or the fear of failure. And we would code them out as NVEs, non-valid essential, because you know what? I, I don't want to offend somebody by making that as a waste. The fact of the matter is that if you don't call the spade for spade, you may become insignificant as organizations. So do not allow the mandates from the past practice to justify NVEs, rather challenge or even better, break the paradigms. Right, so I'm not gonna go to the eight wastes of lean. You know, uh, it used to be seven, we made it now eight, right? The human capital, the non-utilized talent, that's the one area that I really wanna highlight. I feel in a supply chain organization, we simply do not value this asset as importantly as we should. So when you think of this perspective, think, are your functional departments are only focusing on executing the day-to-day -day task? Or are they thinking about innovations? Are they thinking about breaking down the paradigms? Are they thinking about breaking down the barriers? and silos and are they capable of doing it are you giving them the tools and training 
So these concepts that we know that existed in manufacturing and other areas in the practice of lean, are we providing the training? And how do we actually make them be part of this change and transformation? All right, so same lean enterprises, we talked about this. Uh, uh, so nothing changes. So your tool bag that we have can actually become very easily adapted into the field of supply chain organization. Right. We need to adopt a lot of vocabulary, a lot of understanding of the concepts because concepts in supply chains are changing. But if you are transitioning from manufacturing to the supply chain, the myth is that, oh, it's a whole different ballgame. Eh, my challenge is absolutely not. I think there's a lot of parallels that we can adopt and uh, make it happen. I think the Kaizen, albeit it's a soft tool and a process, it works amazingly in supply chain. It's a rapid improvement event so we can schedule and we can deploy those. Uh, you can look at it in terms of different size and types of improvements we're trying to run. And I'm not spending a lot of time because you guys are lean experts. I want to sort of go over just sort of a framework by which things can be actually downloaded. So nothing changes in terms of our tools. The problem solving, so we can still apply the root cause analysis, five Y, seven tools, A3 problem solving. All the strategic problem solving loops that we know, we can continue to deploy that in a futuristic model thinking and keeping in mind the futuristic KPIs are integrated in our problem space, right? I continue to practice these tools and, and deploy them with the futuristic framework. So that was an example of A3. I'm sure everybody's seen it. I still practice it, I still deploy it, and uh, I think it works beautifully. Uh, but the KPIs on the bottom, you can't see it. I've actually introduced a lot of futuristic KPIs into my uh, A3. So I, what I thought would be important uh, is, uh, over the next 15 minutes that I have, is to walk you through the case study that actually is in the supply chain, in healthcare, and how we use sort of a futuristic concepts we talked about it is to innovation rather than improve, and, and breaking the paradigm rather than uh, sort of a putting a bandaid over the bullet hole. So it's a large end-to-end -end supply chain optimizations for the regional hospital, right? Uh, why Kaizen? So we actually deploy to understand the synchronicity from supplier to customer. We want to make sure that it's driven from the data analytics by understanding the root causes, but also driving and empowering cultural transformations from bottom up. And then the biggest reason, biggest reason was to avoid sub-optimizations within supply chain, because I often see that initiatives driven in a silo sub-optimizes the enterprise return on investment. So, if, you know, so we wanted to make sure we integrate ordering, purchasing, warehouse, replenishment, inventory management, and finance as a one entity. And the teams were identified, we did identify some of the key uh, attributes we wanted to go, so we call those uh, Y1 and Really, we looked at it, there was an opportunity to the data and a benchmark, and there was about $5 million in a bottom line savings that we can deliver through supply chain optimization initiative. I imagine if you're in the healthcare business, to generate $5 million in bottom line profit roughly means that you have to generate about $100 million worth of procedural, billable, uh, reimbursable procedures. So if you think from the large standpoint, that's a lot of uh, waste 
that we can eliminate and realize a $5 million in bottom line profit uh, to help the enterprise. Same, you know, project charter, team in actions, uh, so a problem statement. So we just broke it down. I'm taking a lean approach, identifying in a scenario. So multiple redundant inventory locations. So that was a one clear uh, root cause that we looked at it. That there are a lot of deliveries, uh, methods were deployed and inventory locations were identified. Uh, there was a lack of consistent flow. There was like five or six different flows, direct to, direct to flow, cross docking, JIT, bulk deliveries. All of these things were disrupting the optimal flow. Lack of control on order sizes for non-stock and special order. Lack of accuracy and data integrity, data integrity rather, in materials and management information systems. So many, in a data flow, the largest friction was there were so many inputs into the ordering systems, fax, phone call, scribble over the paper napkins in the cafeteria to following the systems protocol. So, I mean, all kinds of variation. So we looked at it opportunity in three-dimensional approach, so service speed and the cost, because we realized that the, without looking at these things as an entirety, you can just solve for the cost by itself or the service by itself on the speed. It needed to have a very integral approach. So process led to decision of centralized uh, material distribution center, single entry point for delivery of goods, allowing to exceed the expectation of customer, deploying effective processing product uh, in a most cost-effective, reliable, and timely way. This is where the most innovations came in place. Data integrity, the backbone systems, we wanted to look at it, state of the art, and how that can support the best in class processes, and promote the goal of service excellence, leading to higher customer satisfaction and integration, meaning going completely paperless with heightened clarity of process to the customer and elimination of waste. So just to give you a highlight, this was the as is process flow, pre-rapid transformation process flow. We went through a series of exercises to understand exactly where was the system interface. So what you see here in the green, where the system was introduced, the rest was all manual interfaces. After the value stream mapping and running it, to the lenses of the futuristic KPIs. The non-value added steps were identified. So you can only imagine from a system that is elaborate, touches so many different things, so many manual patches and interfaces to really understanding the VSM in a futuristic flow ended up identifying this waste. This was huge culturally because we're talking about in innovation, not band-aid solutions to the previous state. And through the use of the system capabilities, it was handheld. process flow chart that now gets integrated into this. Uh, this system is uh, a smartphone based system that app allows complete interface and handle devices either personal or unit driven drives from the customer to the delivery. So this was very profound in a sense that the innovation really overtook the simplification. But as I mentioned earlier, define, measure, analyze process was followed exactly the way that we would follow the irrespective of which industry we're trying to solve the problems with. 
So we, you know, integration was key. What has happened since then? The completed initiatives uh, is done. The mobile supply chain management units are done. The entire hospitals, DCs, wireless capabilities is completed. Uh, human capital, meaning employee training and everything is done. Remember the picture you see to the left, uh, how they used to manage it now into this smaller each pack where the inventory is managed. Uh, it supports the date-driven replenishment so that the waste of obsolete product is no longer there. Uh, Multi-phase implementation strategy was deployed. All three phases have been completed. Uh, phase one was the very first phase, and this is something I would strongly recommend when you're deploying the lean in supply chain with the uh, innovation of this magnitude. Make sure you do bite size implementation because irrespective of how mature the technology solution might be, the learning curve and the challenges associated with the human capital can be overwhelming. So my recommendation would be do the bite size, right? prototype it and be cognizant that your investment in a training has to be there. Phase two, implement the enhanced inventory delivery systems. And then obviously the balanced scorecard and me measuring the futuristic KPIs, which is completely integrated. Introduce the balanced scorecard. And obviously I've taken out the sensitive data. So this is sort of an uh, articulation purpose only. Uh, sort of a balanced scorecard. Basically, the mindset now, the cultural mindset is that getting 90% accuracy, delivering in your supply chain, no longer deserves an A. In fact, 90% in a futuristic KPI, meaning you're drowning. Right? And you, so we need to really set the tone as a leading practitioner in supply chain to say, yes, the cost is important. Yes, the quality is important. Yes, the service is important. Yes, the speed is important. But all four of those things need to be combined together in a very cohesive ecosystem. So this was about four years ago now, and, and the uh, savings have been do doubled up. The latest number was about 4.6, but this was a 1.27 million bottom line savings. Uh, bottom line, efficiencies, best-in-class model, uh, staffing differences, uh, net savings, which includes the learning curves of staffing uh, uh, and training. But the big change that we had to be employed was the leadership. And I'm going to end on this leadership note because everything we talked about, it, about leading supply chain, it's about the personal leaderships, managing change, measuring, understanding rewards and recognition, and understanding how important the leadership is at all level one, two, and three to make this happen. I wanted to share a few lean wisdoms that over the years that I've sort of adapted this into uh, if you don't have time to do it right, you must have time to do it over. So basically this quote by John Wooden really reminds us to do the job right or you'll waste time having it to do it over. In many cases, possibly over and over and over again. Right? This was another favorite my thing is Harvey McKay. Don't water your weeds. Right? Don't incentivize the bad practices and process by ignoring nor rewarding them. Instead, yank them out of the roots. I see in supply chain that we have inefficient processes and we create the lean process projects to create efficiency. But if it's the waste, if it's the weed, if you create a water delivery drip system to, to water the weeds, it's still a weed. 
And I think the supply chain organizations still don't seem to get that. The third, the world we created, it's a product of our thinking. We cannot change it without changing our thinking. Albert Einstein, what a brilliantly said, the mind that creates a problem does not have an ability to solve the problems. Uh, we have to change our paradigm. The paradigm today is the transformation is a norm. The change is a constant. And we are rapidly evolving in a supply chain. Bottom line is either you accept the fact and set the change curve, because if you're in the practice of chasing the trend, I have a bad news, it will destroy you. Remember, as an organization, you have to always remind yourself that you are on the burning platform. Don't worry about the productivity of housekeeping practices if you are on the burning platform. Feel the heat before your normal sense tells you that it's getting hot. Meaning those around you in your marketplace are changing faster and they're not waiting for your permission or an opinion on that. So you have to really drive this train forward with a mindset. The lean is still an incredible practice. We can do some amazing thing, understanding our landscape of today, our horizon, and adapt lean to help us drive the future of the practice in global supply chain management. At this point, uh, I have about 17 minutes and I'm going to open up. Uh, I'm going to see if Frank has anything else to add to this. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nick. Uh, we have a few questions that people have asked. One is, is there a link for futuristic KPIs? So I plan to share this presentation. Uh, and we'll make it available to all of you. But yes, there is a, is a white paper that I've written, and I will make that available to you in the futuristic KPIs for the supply chain. Good, all right, thank you. Uh, how, does, uh, how large does an organization need to be in order to expect significant savings by the application of clean throughout the supply chain? That's a great question, Frank. So futuristic KPI, again, our mindset is it's not the size of the organization, it's the size of impact. So there is no number is necessary. Because remember, most of the disruptions that's been introduced in our industry is the startups. They're changing the norms, they're redefining the boundaries. So they're making a lot colossal of changes and impact with a very small number of people. So I would propose that we start looking at the size in terms of the numbers and the dollars, but rather look at it, what size of impact do we want to make? And I think the answer is already out. You can do amazing things, do great things to drive your customers, irrespective of your size. So it doesn't matter the scale. Uh, what you're saying also reminds me of uh, Eric Reese's book, uh, Lean Startup, because there's, you know, that that gets to that same same urgency um, to uh, to react to the burning platform before you get uh, eliminated. How how long can an organization expect to take before seeing a return on the investment in lean in their supply chain? So I think in a traditional speak, I think in some of this uh, implementation of lean, especially in end to end, I think we can see a very rapid ROI in a traditional speak. Uh, but in a futuristic speak, uh, return on innovation, I think the time horizon will be a bit longer because introducing 
the transformative initiatives can take a little longer in your industry, but the return can be very, very significant. So in a traditional speak, very rapid. In a futuristic speak, it may be longer, but very impactful. And you mentioned uh, doing it in bite-sized chunks too, so that, you know, don't wait until everything is totally packaged. Start implementing what you can in in, um, in small bites. It's easier to digest for the organization, and you, you get value out of it quicker, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's a one a great point, Frank. That you do, there is no perfect solution. You can wait three, four, five years to design one, but rather continue to make incremental improvement, introduce things that you're capable of introducing, and continue to conceptualize while you're doing something better and faster, cheaper, and continue to look on the horizon and keep going at it. I think this is a notion of continuous improvement, but almost on a steroid is what the futuristic lean practices in global supply chain will, will look like. Another question was, uh, where do you see the market forces of transparency and sustainability driving organizations forward right now and five years from now? It's a great question. So I think this is one area the uh, supply chain uh, industry is really, really on the verge of doing something incredible. <laughs> So when we talk about the emerging technology in terms of AI and machine learning, I think there's some great value that will actually get introduced to it. But what I'm really excited about it uh, is a blockchain. So when we talk about the sustainability, <coughs> excuse me. So when we talk about sustainability, I see a tremendous opportunity for blockchain to help solve the problem. So in terms of track and trace, in terms of having the DNA from farm to the fork or design to delivery, I think we will be in a position five years from now to be able to have a much better understanding systemically from the data standpoint and from the reliability standpoint to help us uh, determine how va our value chain and supply chains are synchronized with the proper corporate social responsibility. <coughs> Good, thank you. Um, another question, how often, in reality, how often do you have to perform lean planning? When is the most crucial time to do this planning? So in, in supply chain, I think what, what one thing we all face uh, at every year is our peak season. And I told obviously we would not do the lean planning during the peak season. So I would certainly wait for the time where you can have uh, sort of clarity in organizations where all your department stakeholders, so for your planning, marketing, SNOP, distribution, transportation, retail, all of these guys have sort of uh, time on hand to engage actively. And that time will differ based on the industry that you're in, the vertical within the supply chain that you're in. So find the time where everyone has an ability to be sort of a quiet and not be chasing things that are from a priority standpoint. And that window of opportunity would be the great way to engage organization in the lean planning. I often, like see, I often see organizations try to do this during the peak season, during the seasons where it's organization of uh, corporate goals to go after or objectives to go after. And it really creates a contradiction. It sounds also like you, you really have to carve out some time away from the firefighting of the normal day to day to, to do this right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I always recommend doing it off site, taking it away and disconnecting everyone from the electronic gadgets 
uh, so that it's uh, really you have to have a mind, body, and a spirit, all three present at the same time to really do the link on it. Uh, we've got time for a couple more questions here. Um, you talked about continuous improvement as part of lean improvement, and also mentioned that at times it's about completely reshaping processes. And, you know, it's, it's innovation, right? What is a yep. good what is a good way to understand which of those is necessary when? So Frank, if I understood your question correctly, uh, I think that I've come to hypothesize that conceptualization of innovation and continuous improvement both need to happen concurrently. Meaning, as we continue to improve our current processes, we need to train our minds to look at and reshape the horizon and continue to improve. And so as we journey through from current state to the future state, we already, while we make the future state in the current state, we already think about the future state at the same time. So in other words, the sequencing has to become very synchronized. Uh, and you literally, as an organization, do not get an opportunity to pitch a tent and camp out. You are constantly on a track and tracking. And this may sound somewhat uh, exhausting, but honestly, uh, in the world of global supply chain management, that's what you are. You are on the hike, you are on the journey, and organizations can no longer afford pitching tent because that pitching the tent mentality where you become complacent. The world around you is continually transforming and evolving. And I think that mindset will restrict your ability to keep up and stay up. It sounds a little like training for a marathon, right? It's, it's something that you're doing every day and um, preparing, planning, as well as executing. And uh, uh, you have to do both concurrently from what I hear you saying. Absolutely. And keeping in mind, a good analogy is that not only the physical preparation, meaning getting your body ready, but also getting your mind ready and conditioning both of those simultaneously. And you were talking about the culture of the organization too, right? That That's that's an important part. Uh, one, one last question is how big from your perspective is the resistance to lean in non-manufacturing and what is the best selling point for lean in non-manufacturing? A great question and I am as much as I've been at it for almost 28 years uh, going through introducing me to retail uh, distribution, transportation, uh, you know, healthcare, and now into higher education. Uh, I think the question always is, you don't understand, we're different. Uh, we don't have to change. And and then there, there are nuances of this industry prevents us to deploy lean because it roots our manufacturing. So what I have done and what I'm currently doing in my doctoral uh, dissertation on this very point is to say the data suggest followings and then you highlight very factual information that both parties within an organization can see clearly and detach emotionally. Once you have done that, then you can introduce the lean framework. You say how lean that has been successfully transitioned from manufacturing to various services, including healthcare, can help you. A conceptualize the framework, but B deploy the tools to go after those root causes. And I think there is a receptiveness at some point of gaining the trust. So, you know, it's it's almost like you have to work gracefully of making them understand through data, through facts, and acknowledging the fact 
that it is a different industry. It is a different ways of doing things. And still keeping in mind through influence, making a case that we can do much better and the link can be a substantial tool to help them achieve that. Good, good. Well, I, I want to thank Nick Bias for taking his time out to share with us some very important and interesting information regarding the application of lean in the supply chain. As I said earlier, Nick's presentation has been recorded and will be posted on the ASQ Lean, Lean Division YouTube channel later this week. I want to remind you also that on August 8th at 1.30 Eastern, uh, 10.30 Pacific time, Lance Coleman will be presenting, maybe at risk but not in peril, a webinar on how lean implementation can help manage risk. And do not forget our Lean Practitioners Summit coming up on November 1st and 2nd in Pomona, California, where day one will be a number of tours of organizations, lean organizations like Michael Kors, Hayward Pools, Pomona Valley Hospital in Gildan. Day two, we'll have four workshops on the practical application of lean, including Gemba Walks, Lean and Supply Chain, Toyota Kata, and Lean Leadership and more. Thanks to everyone for participating in today's webinar and have a great day. Thanks. Bye.